Uh, let's get started. So I am Aurelien, one of the co-organizers of uh, Flow, uh, along with Peter Richterich, Virginia Smith, and Alice Starr, Samuel Orlap, and Sebastian Stitch. So the goal of Flow for people who might be first joiners is to be an online forum to discuss the latest results in fidelity learning, trying to cover uh, many aspects, uh, ranging from distributed optimization, learning theory, privacy and security, uh, compression and things related also to systems, hardware, and of course, applications. And uh, before I introduce to the speaker, just a quick recap of how to ask questions during the talk. So all mics are off by default, but you can use the raise hand feature or write the questions in the chat. And then Samuel and I uh, can ask the question for you or we can turn on your mic so you can ask it uh, yourself. Okay, so our speaker has agreed to take questions during the talk, so, so feel free to to uh, yes, to raise your hand or type a question in the chat during the talk. And there will be also, of course, some time at the end for, for questions, additional questions. So great, so our speaker today is Zhang Xu. Uh, doing my best at the pronunciation. Thanks a lot for accepting our invite. Uh, so Zhang is a research scientist at uh, Google. Uh, he received a PhD in computer science from the University of Maryland College Park in 2019. He's worked on, uh, I guess, quite a few topics, uh, ranging from computer vision and domain adaptation, also optimization for machine learning. Uh, and his current interests revolve around optimization and privacy aspects of federated learning. So great uh, combination for, for flow, of course. And today he will talk about federated learning with practical constraints. So I think this will encompass private optimization without relying on amplification by subsampling, which is not so easy to, uh, to leverage in the fidelity learning context. And also questions related to how to model uh, and handle certain forms of data heterogeneity, uh, including some shifts in the distribution uh, that is kind of periodic, that uh, is observed typically in cross-device uh, FL production systems such as the ones uh, of Google. So looking forward to, to this, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot for accepting to give the, the talk. Thanks for the nice introduction and uh, thanks for inviting me to give this talk. Yeah, very glad to talk about some of our recent research, uh, particularly on practical uh, of federated learning in, in like real system uh, related, uh, related research. So, yeah, the first part, the first part of the talk, we will talk about uh, the federated learning with uh, formal differential privacy guarantees. So the the paper is published in SML last year, but as you know, a lot of times a paper is just a start. Then we did a lot of work after the paper is published, and uh, uh, finally, like at, at February this year or sometime, we 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 announced that we can train like a uh, federated learning uh, application, the, the keyboard next word prediction for Spanish language with the formal differential privacy guarantee. So I will talk a, a little bit about that later in the talk, but that, let's see that to give you some context about what this, what, what this work is about. So uh, I guess, People, people in for this talk, people, audience here probably know federated learning already. So I just start from like the federated averaging algorithm, which is one of the most popular algorithm people use in practice for federated learning, particularly for a cross device sighting where the clients are, are mobile devices and uh, these this mobile devices will decentralize training, training their models and send their updates to the server. Like how federated average works is like each communication runs, the server will send a copy of the model to the, to, to the devices who will participate in this round. And after a client get the copy of the, of the model, then they will do some local updates based on their uh, local data. And uh, then they, they will send back the model updates and uh, then the server will aggregate these updates uh, use it to update the global model and uh, potentially start the next round. So how can we get 
uh, how can we get differential privacy in this uh, federated average and framework? Well, it's an algorithm called differential private federated average. The uh, primarily two techniques are used for us to get differential privacy. Uh, first, the, like the, the when the model updates are sent back from client to server, we will clip this update to control the sensitivity. Then after the aggregation, we will add noise proportional to sensitivity when uh, before uh, uh, before applying this update to for the global model. Uh, note that what we get here is a central DP guarantee. Uh, there are other definitions of forms of differential privacy, which is uh, out of the scope of this talk. So one of the, uh, to get a reasonably good privacy utility trade-off, one of the key assumptions we made is that each device will participate with a probability Q. And uh, this probability is then used to to do privacy to do privacy amplification so that we can get a strong epsilon delta bound or other forms of formal privacy bounds in pra uh, in practice. Uh, on the right hand side, we show a curve of some simulation results on the stack overflow data set where Stack Overflow is rel a relatively large data set where you have enough users that can actually simulate some, some uh, actually suitable for simulate differential pri private federated learning algorithms. Uh, the x-axis shows the user level DP parameter epsilon. The smaller means that a, strong, a stronger DP guarantee. The y-axis shows the test accuracy. Uh, and the two curves, one is DP fat average without amplification, without this sampling assumption and amplification. The another curve is just DP fat uh, is, uh, is one is with without amplification, another is with amplification. So if you look at the two curves, there's a gap. Uh, by doing amplification, it significantly boosts the privacy utility performance. However, in a lot of in in, pra in practice for cross device federated federated learning systems, it's very challenging to do sampling for for these mobile devices. The mobile de devices participant in training, like in you know specific ways, like in, in the system, uh, they 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 have non overlapping and limited client availability. Most of the connections are client uh, the, the connections are client initiated. So they have to satisfy certain mostly local criterions to, to see that they want to participate training in this round. Some criterions you may have heard, heard of them before is, is that they have to be connect, they have to connect with to Wi-Fi that they're being charged, they are not being used for other applications. Mm -hmm. That's when they will connect and uh, join in this round of training. Uh, also, it's really hard to know the exact size of the active population, and uh, the, it, it's uh, it's hard to use in in the system due to uh, privacy considerations and how the system is built. It's hard to use some um, load balancing techniques. So. Uh, it's it's really hard to to get amplification by sampling in federated learning, but it's not impossible. And in 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 2019, uh, colleagues of mine have proposed a protocol, but that protocol required complex changes to to our system. And also, this amplification depends on large number of available devices. If you look at the figure on the right, top right, it shows some availability of devices. It, it's not uh, because of this client initiated, uh, initial, initiated communications, and how, uh, how how these client, how these set criterions are satisfied. It's not like a stable uh, distribution. Uh, during usually during the nighttime, you get some more more clients 
than during the daytime. So to have uh, to to assume a, a lot of clients are available is really hard in practice. So let's go back to this curve about privacy utility trade-off and. Um, uh, as shown, the uh, privacy uh, sampling uh, amplification by sampling is really important to get some good privacy utility trade-offs. Can we achieve similar privacy utility trade-offs without doing sampling? So uh, Jay, th this work, yeah. Yeah, there is maybe one question on, on the chat that I can read from Konstantin, uh, if you don't mind on this point. So do you think in addition to local or centralized GP, when, can use classical cryptography, like symmetric protocols, to hide messages inside channels. So I think Konstantin is asking also whether you guys use such things in addition to DP or, or, or not. Um, we, as you may know, uh, when, when we build the system, we also build some encryption method. Uh, the most popular one is the secure aggregation method. Basically, we will only show the aggregated results and to, to protect the, the uh, communication channel. And this is complementary? To, yes, to, it's, to it is complementary, yeah. yeah. Yeah, you can use that, yeah, yeah. So to, to make this- for your, for your response, uh, can, can you just uh, said for this uh, multi-party computation, is uh, do clients need to negotiate common uh, secret key? Just one question. I don't. I know that it is pretty orthogonal to DP, but uh, if you can answer very fast, uh, I will appreciate this. Uh, could you repeat the question? Will the so, client so, so, share so, the key? So, for use this. Uh, secret uh, addition, multi-party competition mechanism that you use in practice, uh, does clients need to negotiate common shared secret key? I mean, shared between clients or, or not, or clients uh, working completely independently? I mean, do, do, does clients, do clients need to negotiate something secret or not? Uh, that, that's beyond my expertise, sorry. <laughs> so okay. I, you have, you have oh. to look look at the paper of secure aggregation. I, I don't know all the details about yeah, that. Yeah, I know, I know, I know, I know. No, just thank you. Thank you, by the way, Arun and Bellet for pointing to the papers. Thank you. Sure, yeah, I just, uh, yeah, I just sure. put the, the pointers to the papers because I think it is a bit or, indeed orthogonal to... Yeah, 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 but... To the talk, so... Yeah, thank you. Thanks for, for the question. Uh, I think there was another question quickly, sorry. I think it, it is on this figure from Hong, why the test accuracy in this slide isn't such a range, what kind of learning task is it? So I guess just being uh, curious about yeah. this 20% uh, uh, accuracy, but I guess there are many classes. So this is a next world prediction task. Basically you will predict the next word appear in the sentence. And uh, um, I think maybe you, 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 you're just concerning that the accuracy seems to be low for a task like this, because of because our output space is so large, you have a large vocabulary size. So 20 percentage is actually not that bad. <laughs> I will see. Uh, okay, so thank you for your answer. So may, may I also ask, so uh, these uh, experiments must be done, like for example, in the DP regime, it should be in a fixed uh, delta, right? So, and that also affects the readouts, right? Yeah, we always use a data that is smaller than one over the population size. For these stack overflow experiments, specifically, we use 10 to the negative six for, for data. Okay, so it's uh, like one to the whole uh, population, the, the, da the data sample population. Right? Yeah, so basically any number smaller than that can is probably potentially a reasonable data you, you can use. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you, I got it. Sure. So, All right, so you, you, you can continue. There are no more questions at this one. Thanks. Cool, yeah. So uh, 
Yeah, we will, we we have this new algorithm called DPFTRL, which can help us achieve this goal. That even without sampling for amplification, you can still get reasonably good privacy utility trade-offs. And as shown on the right side curve, the 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 right the right line is the DPFTRL results. Okay, now what's the uh, the key idea of this DPFTRL algorithm is that. You similar to you before you still clip the gradient to control the sensitivity, but instead of adding independent noise each round, you will add noise pro uh, proportional to sensitivity following a trace, uh, following a specialized trace structure. And uh, let's go dive into some details of that. The first step, what we do for, for to to get this DPFTRL results is that we deconstructing model training of fat average. Uh, uh, what, what, what do I mean by that? First, we get an initialized model. And uh, for one round of training, we will get a lot of mobile devices. We will aggregate their model updates and uh, use that aggregated results to model to update this global model. And uh, we get a we get a new model and to start a new round. And then another round starts. We get uh, aggregated updates and uh, do the update again. Look at when we get this theta two. We will we will use the aggregated results of uh, uh, aggregated updates of t one to uh, and the update theta one to get this theta two. But another view of it is that we, we, it can be viewed from like starting from theta zero and uh, use the prefix sums of all these updates to, to get to this new model theta two. And uh, uh, similarly, we can get, we have another round, we get model updates and use it to update, get a new model. So the key observation is that we, the, these model updates, this fat aberration algorithm are not limited to fat aberration. So any training algorithm, like the first order optimization methods, you can deconstructing this training process by, by like using the prefix sum of these model updates to do, to, to do the training. So, uh, and the only this prefix sum that is related to the gradients and the updates are data dependent that need to be privatized. So uh, let's look at how DP fat average works in this uh, in, in this view of like using the prefix sum for updates. Like when you get the, when you when you have the one round of training, you get the aggregated results. You will add some independent noise to the to these updates and use it to update the model. And the, the next round starts, you get you get aggregated result p one, and you will add another independent noise n one, and uh, and now you have n n zero and n one for this prefix sum of t zero plus t one. And uh, if you start from theta, uh, theta zero, you can use it to update your model. And uh, you can uh, go, go on and uh, have, have multiple rounds of updates. And uh, notice that once you add the noise, the noise will always be there and, uh, for these prefix sums. And uh, then you can use this to get the DP model. Uh, now let's look at what DPFTRL that uh, did and uh, what DPFTRL does and uh, how we can use uh, uh, like a tree structure to achieve our goal. So the technical details showed here is that the first round you still add, add one uh, noise N0 to your aggregated updates T0. And uh, in, the, uh, in the second round, we'll get, we'll get another update for this for this prefix sum T0 plus T1, you will just add one noise and, and uh, sub zero one to it. And this noise is added based on this tree structure. So then you, you will get another, uh, you will get another uh, aggregated results T, T2 and the noise you added here is the N sub zero one and the new noise N2. 
And uh, when you when you get a new uh, when you get a new updates, then look at the tree structure is that whenever this this uh the updates are basically the, the leaves of that tree. Whenever they can form a subtree, you can you 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 can you can add the noise for the for the for the for the root of that subtree. So that's how uh, that's what we do for this DPFTIL algorithm. And uh, the the key idea is that you add noise for the uh, following tree structure, and the sum of the previous uh, noise may be removed when you when when you at a at a certain point. And uh, compared to what DP fat origin is that the noise you, you will add ID noise, and noise will always be there. So just looking at this, it may be too optimistic about seeing that if you if you uh, for this DPFTIL, you are basically adding less noise than DPSGD. Um, but to, we, uh, it actually needs more uh, workout on the privacy side on uh, on exactly what's happening and the the noise you added for DPFTIL is the skill of the noise is different from what the skill of the noise you added for DPSGD. So more precisely, the total noise you added for DPFL origin uh, without amplification, it's, it's at a O square root N over, uh, over epsilon scale. And if with amplification is O1 over epsilon. For this DPFTIL, you have a log N over epsilon. If you look at these numbers, this log n is still slightly larger than the amplification results, but it's not uh, not that bad because it's a log factor. Also, for this result, it completely removes the constant, and this constant actually matters a lot in practice. In some follow-up work, I think Chris Rush and uh, Brandon Mac. McMahon the uh, Aberdeep, they gave uh, the previous talk of, about their ongoing work on matrix factorization. Through that work stream, you can significantly reduce the constant for, for this DPFTIL algorithm. There are other practical tricks we used. And the, the previous slides about how you add noise by uh, following a tree structure is the main idea. There are other things like the Honaka trick. You can reduce the total variance you added uh, through this process. And we use momentum as GD. We add momentum there so that the performance is, can be better. Uh, another key idea we, we use to get this work in practice is that this, the theory of DPFTR is based on an on, online one pass algorithm. We have to limit the client participation for multi pass algorithms. And there are some implementation details. We, we won't save like the prefix sum, and we will only, you know, the, once the update is used, we will remove it completely. In some sense, we will only save the state of the noise. In some sense, if you have this, you can recover that on the server side. Uh, but uh, yeah, that's, uh, that also depends on when all these results and, uh, are released and who, who can access all these in, uh, uh, intermediate results. And we, uh, it requires some log -in memory usage to build this tree. Uh, we have some open source uh, implementation if you're interested in giving it a try. So John, maybe just uh, if I can ask a question here. So, so there are many very interesting points I think listed here. Uh, some of them are quite subtle and, and not, not so trivial, uh, I think. Uh, yeah. uh, but, but I guess I wanted to ask uh, maybe just uh, if you could clarify a bit what changes in the algorithm. So the way you presented this before, um, maybe a, you know it, it felt like maybe the algorithm was essentially the same and you were just kind of changing the perspective of or the kind of the way you add the noise, but they, they are also a bit more significant changes to the optimization algorithm itself, right? You cannot do exactly the same steps as in that averaging, if I'm not mistaken, or? Actually, that, yeah, that's, that's pretty right. That's right. The main change we made is how you add noise, how, how, you, how, how you view the algorithm and then, uh, 
the first thing is like instead of viewing it, it uh, like every time you take one step, we view it like you you can use a prefix sum of all these to update your model. Then based on that, we only need to privatize this pref prefix sum. Then then we but then how we private this prefix sum is that we use a tree structure to achieve that. And the, this tree structure mainly affects how you add noise. So essentially, it's in some sense compatible with a lot of optimization algorithm you may develop. The main change is how you add noise. But you, you have to be careful here to make sure that your algorithm is still compatible with what we have for this tree structure, how we how we control sensitivity and the sense like that. Yeah, you, you also mentioned that the convergence analysis uh, differs a bit too, right? I mean. Uh, so the analysis in DP is slightly different. No, it's, it's, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so I mean, usually you, you, you have, a, you, you, have you, you care about population risk because, because that, because you keep adding noise, then the conf, conf, you may not converge actually. In, in some sense, yeah. Right, right. So, so it's more of an online learning kind of view, right? In yeah. terms of the, the yeah. convergence, like uh, analysis of, of, of the algorithm or utility analysis, let's say, in this case. But, yeah, actually, for this algorithm, we get the best rate for online citing if it's single pass. OK, OK. Yeah, uh, also, that's also does not consider the constant. Uh, all right, thanks. Cool. So let's continue. Let's look at some of the practical results. This is like the, the curves of on Stack Overflow data set. And we have, uh, uh, as, uh, as we can see, that the, the DPFTIL results is competitive with DP Fed average, and even with amplification when the epsilon is relatively when the epsilon is relatively small uh, and uh, when epsilon is relatively large it outperforms dp uh, dp fat average and it always better than dp fat average without amplification uh, another interesting thing is that if if we slightly increase the the, uh, the computation cost Let's say we use four times clients per round compared to uh, compared to before, we can get significantly better re results. So note that this is not an entirely fair comparison between DPFTRL and DPSGD because you can always do that for any algorithm. But why we care about this is like we, this is how we achieve a good privacy guarantee without hurting utility in practice is that in practice we we somewhat relying on this hypothesis or conjecture is like for sufficiently large data set the utility accuracy will not drop if we can increase the noise multiplier and the current for round proportionally so because you increase the noise multiplier, your DP guarantee gets much better. And uh, this clients per round is a cost you have to pay, the computation cost you have to pay to get a good privacy, uh, privacy protection. So privacy is not easy, but at least at industry, we are willing to pay such cost to give you a good privacy protection. So yeah. Based on this, uh, uh, let me talk a little bit of, of exactly what we did to to use this algorithm to get a real like usable model in Gboard. Uh, here we train a, 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 RN, a RSTM language model for the next next word prediction task for Spanish language for Gboard users. The parameter size is one uh, one point three million. And we run for about 2,000 rounds over six days. And we use a large number of clients per round. It's 6.5 thousand, 6,500. 6, That's how we can still get a good utility without uh, under a, a reasonable like privacy guarantee. 
and uh, each device will participate uh, at most once every 24 hours. Uh, we we you, we we have described how we do the privacy accounting in the paper and also release a collab to do to do to to, do, to show exactly how we do accounting how we use to the how how we get the privacy guarantee we have and these are announced in the blog post so to the best of our knowledge this is the first production neural networks that can train with uh, directly on user data with uh, formal DP guarantees. So what are the DP guarantees of this? Uh, if you look at the Epsilon Delta DP, Epsilon is about 8.9 and the Delta we use is 10 to the negative 10. Uh, and uh, also uh, there's another advantage of this DPFTIR algorithm is that you can get this ZCDP bound, which is 0.81. If you know that the U.S. Census Bureau also use this CCDP for their results, and their CCDP is at a two point six or some some or at least larger than two, so this zero point eighty one is in some sense smaller than 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 the what the U.S. Census Bureau error has been has been using for releasing results, so. You, you know there's a star mark for the well-behaved clients. This is uh, like something we, we have to assume that clients will follow the algorithm and um, yeah, they are they're, they're in some sense not adversary to, to, to the privacy algorithm. So the model quality of this algorithm uh, uh, from DPFTR trend is also better than our previous results trend by DP Fed averaging. Okay, I think that's the first part of the talk. If you have any question about this part, it's probably a good time to ask. For the next part, I will talk about periodic distribution shift and uh, how we use multi-branch networks to, to tackle this issue. I see there is a question from Constantine, so I'll try and mute him. Thank you. Uh, so, because the talk is uh, named uh, Fedorov's learning with practical constraints, I think my question is relative, but it's not relative to the DP aspect. So, during training Google Keyboard Next prediction, uh, did you measure uh, memory footprint in mobile devices? Because uh, wor during working on experiments for federated learning, at least I carry experiments with the big GPUs in a standalone machines. Also, uh, for mobile, real mobile devices, typically there is no GPUs or GPUs are very uh, slow and don't, that doesn't have like a lot of memory. So did you train, if it is not a secret, this LSTA model with 1.4 million parameters in CPUs of these mobile devices? Thank you. Yes. Thanks for the question. Uh, I think you're right. A lot of mobile devices don't have GPUs. All the GPUs are not as powerful as, uh, it's not the common sense GPU we, we can think about for our workstations. About the questions about memory keyboard, footprint. memory oh. footprint, I think at least we, we, we are not collecting this information from from like users uh, uh, about the memory footprint i i don't know for sure and uh, also I, i'm not sure if this is some information we can share <laughs> okay thank you any other questions Okay, so I'll start the second second part of this talk. Cool, let's talk about periodic distribution shift and uh, multi-branch networks. And uh, this is a, the, the paper of, uh, about this work is published in iClear this year. So this is a practical observation we found when we train like, uh, uh, let's see, again, there's an example of a next world prediction models for a keyboard is that 
the the curves show some oscillation, and this oscillation correlated with the the time of the day. So it, it during the night time it seems usually better, and during daytime it's you will see a drop, gradual gradual drop. And uh, let's zoom in a little bit. Uh, and you can see the oscillation so that you can see the os oscillation of, of the curve. So the oscillation is in you know, a certain range, but it still puzzles us. And uh, we, are, we are wondering what happens and uh, how we can mitigate this or improve the performance. And uh, to help, help understanding what's happening, we train, we actually show three curves and the train three models. The red curve is uh, is a model trend for all during all time, both day and night, and uh, the 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 blue curve is trend on using devices only at during the night time, and the the, the orange curve is trend to use devices uh, participant in the daytime. If you look at that, you you will see that. Usually, the tr the model trend with all time still performs the best, but the the like the model trend with only nighttime clients are close, and the the daylight time sits like usually a little bit worse than than the, the performance of others. Uh, uh, and uh, also, you can see that the gap between the curves is not that consistent. Sometimes the gap can be slightly larger, and sometimes the gap can be slightly, uh, can become smaller. So, so for, for this observation, the one conjecture we have is that this period, there are some periodic distribution shifts of clients during the training process. And one reason is that the, the, the model train, the clients for this training, they are from different time zones. If you remember, we mentioned that if a client wants to participate in training, they have to meet certain criteria like in charge, uh, not being used, uh, connected to Wi-Fi, et cetera. These criteria make, make it easier for clients to participate during their own night time. But but because of the time zone difference, the, so uh, because of the time zone difference, so clients participants at different times may come from different time zones. So this is a conjecture, and uh, this conjecture is made in a previous paper when uh, talking about Gboard network prediction language model training. And uh, we we are actually not certain about this conjecture. And uh, we don't know exactly what caused this oscillation. Uh, can we do some simulation to show to to for this for this behavior for this observation uh, so that we can start this problem? In in 2019, a previous paper assumed a block cyclic shift of uh, between two distributions. One is the daytime distribution, another is the nighttime distribution, and uh, uh, during half of the day, you will use a daytime clients, and the half of, another half of the day, you will use a nighttime clients. And the curve looks as below. So it shows the some of the uh, some of the oscillation, but looks not quite the same as what we observed in practice. And uh, in in this in this paper in this talk, we we started like. We 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 formulated that there should be a there is potentially a smooth transition between the two distributions. And as you can see, the curves now looks similar, more at least more similar as what we observed in practice. Another thing is that we generally makes the two distribution wise harder than the other to match the observation that daytime seems to work better. In, in practice of in the first curve we show. So yeah, in the in the previous smooth transition, we basically linearly transform from one mode or one distribution to another. Uh, there are there are potentially other forms of distribution. We don't know exactly for sure. So 
So in our simulation, we, we, we introduce a parameter P so that we can get different versions of this periodic shift. And we will test our algorithm under this different, different distribution shift for robustness. They all share a similar, similar pattern that we will need, it will gradually transition from one peak to another. But the shape of this distribution shift can be different. Also, it's worth mentioning that this parameter, parameter P is used for simulation and is unknown for the actual training algorithm we will later introduce. Okay, so now we know that now we, uh, we, 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 we are in this setting that we have this periodic distribution shift. Uh, can we do better than fat averaging, which is a popular algorithm we use for general training? And this fat averaging, of course, it assumes no periodic distribution shift. A common simulation setting is that you just uniformly sampling clans from the uh, from the population to do to do the training. Yeah. So what we do is like we want to introduce a multi-branch networks. Why we want to do this is like, even if you have to potentially daytime distribution and nighttime distribution, we believe there are, there are more common in this than the difference. The, the, the representation should be shared. And by, by having these shared representations, these feature extractors, we, it's good for sample efficiency. And uh, we introduce these lightweight branches. It's good for on-device training and the inference because it does not require a lot more resources to train these networks. And we have a feature-based mixture model or cluster models so that you can use this multi-branch network. You will, you will uh, this module can predict which branch you use for inference and uh, during training. Uh, one, one notable thing about this is like different from a, a lot of clustering or mixture model approach in federated learning. This module is purely feature-based. It does not require any label on Anson class to be used. So let's look at how we, how can we train this multi-branch network. Uh, the first thing we tried is like a vanilla clustering approach, but this is hard. Cluster clustering of clients in federated learning hard. I, uh, my, this is again some conjecture we have is that the, because of the heterogeneity clients, there are some natural ambiguity in how you can do clustering of clients in, in federated learning. Another difficulty is like, like, like we talked before, there's potentially a large population and every round there's only a small number of clients participating in training. This stochasticity and this current sampling makes it even harder for you to do the clustering together with the federated average in training. And uh, what, uh, another thing is like this, we, we turn this periodic distribution shift from a disadvantage to something we can take advantage of. Uh, we, we actually have some interesting prior information from this periodic uh, distribution shift. Like the peak time of each mode is in some sense known for us. And uh, we know that it can do a smooth transition from one, one mode to another mode. And uh, now let's introduce our algorithm. The first algorithm we have is uh, 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 like k-means clustering based algorithm. And it has that the temporal prior, so we name it fat TKM. Mm -hmm. uh, so we will we will do a clustering together with fat fat average and training. And uh, on the clients, we will use this clustering module to predict branches and only train the corresponding branch. And how we incorporate the temporal prior is that we have we have an extra scalar alpha that may control the size of the two clusters. So the idea is like when you do, remember how you do a vanilla k-means clustering is like 
you will assign one assign one one sample to the cluster that uh, to the cluster that has the smallest distance between this sample and the cluster center. And we have this alpha parameter to rescue this distance. So if this alpha is large, it potentially makes a client to be assigned to this cluster harder. So it's slightly shift, it can shift the boundary between two clusters. And we 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 use the quantile, we, we can estimate the quantile of the clustering assignment on each cluster and use that to update this, the, this scalar parameter alpha. More details can be found in the paper. And, uh, and another algorithm we developed is a mixed model based. It's a GMM, parameter, GMM based parameter. So why we have these two algorithms is that, well, this fatty TM in some sense can perform better in, in, in applications like we, the algorithm actually asks the client to send some more statistical information to the server. So there are some module in the server, if you look at the algorithm that will rank the, this statistics and uh, assign clients to different clusters to readjust the assignment on the server. This may, uh, this may not be the best approach from a privacy perspective that you you can oh, even if it's it's just a scalar or some some in, uh, aggregated results of each client they these results um, we will prefer in federated learning that you can aggregate it, the results across clients so that the server will only see aggregated results and that can be achieved by this fat TPM algorithm. If you look at what I showed on the slides is that the fat TKM will only see aggregated results. Even if it's a scalar, it, this is more like, uh, this aligns better with the price privacy principle we have for, for federated learning. Uh, so, because we like see we send less information in fat TKM, we want to know whether uh, whether we can estimate the distribution shift well, and uh, this shows a curve. The on the on the uh, the top curve is the actual di distribution shift we have for these simulation experiments, and the bottom curve is what we estimated through controlling this single scalar parameter alpha. Um, it seems to work pretty well, at least for this CIFAR data set, the simulation experiments we have. And let's look into uh, more details about our simulation experiments. We have three data sets, EMNIST, CIFAR, and the stagger flow. For each data set, we we use two different population to different distributions as day, daytime mode and the nighttime mode. For EMNIST, it's the EMNIST version of 10 labels versus 62 labels. So for CIFAR, it's CIFAR 10 versus CIFAR 100. For stagger flow, it's the question text versus the answer text. Also, you may notice that for, for, for this, for the two modes we chose for each task, one is usually harder than the other. And we have some baseline methods. A natural baseline is the semi cyclic SGT method, which is developed before, which assumes the block cyclic structure of, of the distribution shift. We, we compare with some clustering approach and some EM algorithms. And uh, usually you, we will use a branch of the algorithm if they assume the labels on Anson test uh, class can be achieved to, for, for doing clustering or other, other parts of their model. We will either give them privilege so that they, they can access these ground truth labels to do clustering or use, um, or use the confidence instead of loss if they use loss for clustering. Okay, this is the results for EMNIST. There's a lot of curves in this. Let's take a detailed look. 
First, we ver the x-axis is a p-parameter. We vary this to simulate different kinds of distribution shifts. And uh, uh, the, it, this flat curve is a strong baseline we have for doing a flat average without periodic distribution shift. It's, you can uniform sample these clients. You can see that a lot of baselines, they can struggle with, uh, with, uh, without using the temporal information under the periodic distribution shift setting. And the proposed method seems to work well. Uh, similarly, uh, uh, let's see, we, uh, the observation, we can have, have uh, observation on Cypher and uh, Stagger flow. One notable thing is on Stagger flow, although both FATTKM and FATTM performs better, there's a gap between the performance of FATTM and the FATTKM. Okay, so, I think we, we, we have five minutes left. So that concludes the second part of the talk. If people have questions, I'm happy to answer that. If otherwise I can continue to do a very brief intro of a new results we have. It's actually not published yet, but we are expect to put this on our archive very soon. Okay, I'll, I'll continue then. So this is a more theoretical understanding of what heterogeneity means in federated learning. I'll show you a motivating example here. Let's see, let's consider a linear statistic model. Our assumption is that a single global model works reasonably well for all clients, but each client will have different data and uh, uh, the, and this statistic model will create like the labels Y based on different noise epsilon. And how, how uh, our problem is like, we, we are trying to solve this statistic model and find the optimal global model W star. And we will write a regression objective like this. It's uh, average uh, each, each Client have their own objective FC, and it's average over all its samples, over n samples it has. If you look at this objective, that uh, you can have a close form for this object uh, for this quadratic problem, because of the data heterogeneity and uh, of x and the the uh, the limited number of samples n, these clients will have different local minimizers. And uh, if you look at what most of this, a lot of theories do in federated learning is that they will use this gradient dissimilarity for, to measure heterogeneity in federated learning setting. And uh, for this specific problem, for this motivating example, you can get a somewhat close form uh, formulation of this gradient dissimilarity. It depends on, it, it's the uh, expectation of the square of this BC. And uh, you notice that this BC is, is, depends on epsilon and the X. When the variance epsilon is large, this gradient dissimilarity can be arbitrarily large. It can be very large. So the heterogeneity can be very large. But if you look at the convergence of this, this is a quadratic problem. You can work out and uh, look at the convergence. It's, it's actually not that bad. Even if the epsilon is large, it's, the convergence is, can be pretty fast. There's a mismatch here. That this like heterogeneity is, uh, is the right way to characterize the convergence behavior of federated learning. And, in some sense, we also know that fat average performs super well in practice, particularly for cross-device federated learning setting. So yeah, in, in this new paper, we are trying to try our trying some efforts to help bridge this gap between the practice and the theory. I won't do more, I, I won't talk more in here and uh, if you are interested, you are more than welcome to look for the paper. I know it's not public yet. We will, we will do that soon. 
So yeah, there are a lot of uh, we talk about three things in this talk, like mainly on DPFTIL to get formal differential privacy guarantee in federated learning, then periodic distribution shift, and uh, how we use multi-branch networks in it. And uh, at last, a little bit uh, about how we want to understand heterogeneity for federated learning. There are a lot of interesting stuff, open problems and the future works we, we can do for all these directions. If you're interested, feel free to reach out. So for DPFTIL, we are actually trying to do more applications in practice. And uh, as you know, federated learning has a lot of hyperparameters and uh, having DP there introduce even more how to reduce, how to correctly tune these hyperparameters or make them automatic is an uh, is, uh, interesting topic. And uh, as always, improving privacy utility trade-offs makes it both easier to use and uh, performs good in practice is, uh, is, a, is a topic we keep investigating. And for periodic distribution shift, uh, remember what we have for this multi-branch is a pure empirical approach. There are certain theoretical aspects of that well, that we did not explore yet. And we, we potentially want to verify this hypothesis in practice. And uh, if it's possible, we want to know if there are simple strategies, strategies that can tackle this problem and give us better performance. And from the theoretical side, we are interested in like uh, working together with academy researchers and also to encourage people to look at theory results that that aligns better with practical settings. I know there are already a lot of exciting works in recently published that are in this direction. And I think that's a good sign of this community. Yeah, I think that that's all I want to talk about. Thanks for listening. Thanks a lot for the very nice talk. I think you you, you stopped with a quite big cliffhanger, right? Uh, you only uh, pointed at the, the gap uh, without giving any hints at, uh, <laughs> at what you get or where you go from there. Uh, so looking forward to, to checking that paper. Um, any, any questions in, in the audience? So maybe I have one on this uh, distribution, periodic distribution shift. So you focused, uh, I think the, the approach that you propose is not limited to this, but you kind of focused a bit on this uh, right night versus day. So kind of two, two modes in a way in, in the distribution, I guess, in practice. So this corresponds to maybe time, but of course in practice, there is also, I guess, uh, location, uh, heterogeneity, which, also is mixed up with this time heterogeneity, right? Because people live in different time zones. And so what may be the middle of the night uh, will be the middle of the day or half a day or uh, I mean, whatever, right? All these things would be intertwined. Uh, so how important is it to kind of be able to model this ex explicitly, you think? Or what are these kind of two branches approach seems to be enough in, 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 in in practice, uh, I don't know. I was wondering a little bit, right? How far do you have to go in modeling these these shifts? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I guess in general, that seems to be to like towards the direction that if we have more metadata, not just time, maybe like locations or other things, can we use that? to improve our performance potentially by having multiple branches or different different kind of network architecture. I think that's a that's a great good direction we can look at, but I don't have a like conclusive answer. It's a potentially interesting research topic if people are interested in looking at maybe that's something worth trying. So I guess one thing is that this is also something we consider for this work is that if you have too many branches, if you have too or, or not or not branches, too many models, the data you train for each model is like 
smaller. And uh, this data efficiency issue is one of the main reasons we designed this multi-branch network. And a lot of tasks, even if the distribution is different, there are more common stuff than, than, the, than the difference for these different distributions. Like this neural networks, it's known for representation learning. So if, if it's all image, it, image tasks, there should be some sheer representation. If it's language task, at least the vocabulary or something can be shared. All right, maybe a follow up on, on, on this. So I guess you didn't pronounce the word uh, personalization, right? But, but of course, this, this problem is kind of uh, very related to this. Uh, yeah. What you are doing is some kind of personalization in, in, right, for, for these two groups. Yes. So yeah, I, I guess it's more observation or, or do you see, I'm not sure what to think about the links between those, those things, right? So uh, these distribution shifts in time and the relation to personalization, those, those things might not be exactly the same, right? No. Yeah, I think one thing is like for for this periodic distribution shift, the the advantage and the disadvantage are both that the it's constrained. Like it's the temporal shift that you it's hard for you to control, but also it gives you some hints, some prior that you can use. Like I mentioned, we also try to like just doing a clustering approach without these hands, it's it's very hard, as as shown in a lot of previous papers, and uh, also also in when we do our experiments. Particularly if you consider that you you are doing client sampling every round. If you have all the clients ready to do clustering once, that can potentially work in both theory and uh, practice in some sense. But if you consider client sampling, you cannot access to all clients, or even you can only potentially access a partial mode during a certain round. This problem becomes very hard. Yeah. Another thing is like, yes, this is closely related to precision and uh, this clustering approach, or in general, a lot of like personalization re uh, research in, in like in federated learning focus like uh, on the like a practical approach, this fine tuning approach. Um, but there are other variants, like I believe outside of federated learning, feature based personalization is actually very popular. And this clustering approach is another thing people may consider. And, uh, um, yeah, I yeah. Yeah, thanks, <laughs> that, that addresses it. So, so I agree, okay, with such distribution shifts, uh, at least you, at the same time, it's, it's, it, it can be harder to deal with. At the same time, you might have some knowledge of the phenomenon, some prior knowledge or metadata that can help you model it uh, uh, better, right? That in, if you are a little bit more agnostic, uh, like maybe most personalization approaches. Okay, anyway, uh, uh, I think these in interactions are, are quite interesting.